Welcome to Grail Country. Uh, my guest today is Hezzy, who you, some of you, most of you really will know. Um, frequent uh, interlocutor in our little corner of the internet. And uh, I've been wanting to talk to Hezzy again for a long time, like ever since our last conversation. And I know, like, I, I shared a copy of uh, Robert Jensen's essay toward a Christian theology of Israel and proposed discussing that. But I'm really kind of open to discussing whatever Hezzy wants to discuss. Um, and uh, so, yeah. Like, so we can either start with, like, what your thoughts on the essay were, or something else you want, like, if you, or, or we just jump right into, like, set me straight on the Noahide thing. What am I getting wrong? That could be another point of entry. Like, wherever you want to start, I think if we just start talking, we'll go somewhere interesting. Uh, I hear that. So, first off, uh, thank you so much for uh, cultivating the space, creating the space where conversation like this could happen. I just think it's... Uh, it's Maybe we're a little spoiled in the TLC that we could have these kind of conversations, but uh, it's been um, thousands, and hundreds, and even thousands of years since conversations like this can happen with uh, with uh, everyone being comfortable and in humor. So I, I I just think just this conversation within itself is is, is miraculous. So uh, so thank you. Um, second of all, we could we could touch upon both of those uh, topics. Um, they, like most things, they intertwine as well. So I think uh, you might have uh, just a, a natural dovetailing over here. Um, specifically, just for some context, um, uh, our dear Nate um, was uh, saw uh, the Christian Baxter uh, podcast video of his conversation with me where we discussed some of uh, the Noahide path and alongside a conversation with regards to proselytizing, uh, this seemed to bother uh, Nate. And if I understand correctly, Nate, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, your claim was um, that uh, this to me sounds foreign to, and coming from a person who is sending you this Jensen thing, right? So, Chazi, you know I'm no hater of of, of Judaism. And more than that, I'm even willing to explore an idea where, like, you know, two of these branches are 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 growing and evolving together side by side. Nevertheless, why are you bringing in this foreign element called uh, the Noahide path? Uh, and then uh, uh, it's it's uh, historical uh, context being, let's say, uh, it's, it's claiming that it's not it's not uh, part of the original uh, original package, so to speak. And um, uh, that bothered you, um, so I wanted to just first of all just explore a little more about like what 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 bothering you, and if, if I'm uh, if I'm uh, articulating that correctly. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty fair. That's pretty fair. And um, so my under like and correct me if I get anything wrong. My understanding is that for for the most part, like the mod the modern Noahide movement, like has its origins in the, like the mid nineteenth century. Um, the mo the modern one, right? Yeah. So certainly, like, and I'm, I'm perfectly willing to grant that certainly there have been periods of history where Judaism has been more like this. I mean, that's just that's historical fact. I mean, it's like you know, uh, certainly during the classical age. Um, Judaism was um, more more open to extending itself, shall we say? There was even a period where where they were even proselytizing. Um, I, I would just just for one moment let down that historical note um, that Maimonides really you know really. Uh, uh, builds this foundation around it while claiming yeah. it's still uh, its historical context, but that's roughly a thousand years ago. Now, you have to remember that throughout almost all of Jewish history, or uh, the, the, the nation of Israel, um, we're usually being chased, right? So most of the time, it's really much of fending ourselves, establishing ourselves. There's almost never room for... Uh, you know, proselytizing or creating a system or a conversation with the rest of the world out there. So, right. why this is not a conversation, why this is not a conversation we've heard it for a very long time, uh, 
is is most probably due to the fact that it just really was not relevant. So, so much so that I would say that in Israel and in uh, Orthodox circles, right, there's pushback to this. This is a growing movement recently, and the pushback is not that I, well, sometimes it's, I don't even know about this. I mean, I could point it out to them, and they're like, wow, that's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Or two, I know about this, but don't we have, like, still poor brothers and Jewish brothers and sisters on the street? Don't we still have to deal with our own internal issues before we start talking about, like, this universal uh, uh, mission? So, um, but, like, sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, that's understandable. I mean, obviously, it requires a certain degree of stability um, uh, in order to even be able to think about even to be able to think about that so yeah i get that That, i track with that um so i see by the way someone uh commented i think that there's a a comment about the audio so i'm gonna try to put headphones and you'll let me know or the i guess the hive mind will let me know if this is more disruptive or helpful okay Uh, i mean not trying in any way to be uh, problematic. Um, one second. You'll excuse our technical difficulties for a moment. <laughs> I'm always too loud, Sherry. <laughs> That's far for the course. Uh, I'll try to be quieter. It's all good. Uh, these seem not to be working, so it is what it is, folks. I'm sorry. Well, I'll I try could... to closer towards the speaker all right it's not it's not like horrible it's it's not horrible it's it's, it's not like the worst audio ever at least at least it doesn't sound like that on my end so oh, sorry. Um, yeah it's not like you're breaking up or anything um so okay so yeah i i guess it's just like just to be like it just it seems like from my point of view it looks like it, it looks like a very Christian thing to do. Which is what? Which is to be like actively proselytizing outside of your own faith tradition. Right. So let's let's just okay, let, on my end, let me try to clarify what the movement I'm working for. Uh, um, so the the brief Brit Olam um, is, which is the, the national, the, the international, the world no uh, center in Jerusalem. Um, it's really not about proselytizing. It, as this phenomenon is starting to grow, there's up to like around 100,000 Noahides uh, in the world. And um, I'm, I'm witnessing, the only reason I also got involved in this is because I found myself in a space like this where I'm also witnessing quote unquote live Noahides in the wild, right? Like out there and they're sort of reaching out. And mm-hmm. in that case, I almost feel like this is a, a, a thousand year old year of Torah that suddenly becomes applicable today. So all these things start aligning, uh, or at least the way I'm seeing these things, or at least the way uh, uh, different spiritual leaders that I'm, uh, uh, rabbinic leaders that I'm connected connected to see, the, see these things unfold. And, uh, I don't go out proselytizing. I simply uh, create a space where if someone is looking and wants to know, they're welcome to ask. Now, um, it, it really is it's important to, to explain that distinction, which is uh, when Noahides want to be involved, like, you know, if you really want to ask and be involved and ask questions, there's a book you could buy, right, where you could learn more about this. And if you want to, you could ask, like, all the classes are very much given in the context of, these are the seven no head laws. These are things you can take on, but remember, you're not required to take this on. You don't have to take this on. And it's at the level of depth that the participant wants to go. So if uh, uh, someone in the group wants to ask more questions, then they're welcome to ask more questions. And then it's really where they want to where, where they want to stop. It's built into the system, which is I'm not even supposed to be teaching them specific elements. Now, there are some that interpret this as being a very strict regiment of just these seven. There are others, uh, and their school of thought is one that I, uh, I, I agree with, which is anything that uh, that a Nohai wants to learn about the Torah, he's welcome to learn. And 
as they take on more responsibilities and then they show that they want to be connected in this way, they can take on more and more of these commandments as well. Uh, uh, so it's really not something that I'm going out and pushing. It's just creating a space that if someone is interested and wants to know, then something like that exists. That is happening at the same time, though, and it's really... It, You know what? How about you could comment on that? I'm sure we're going to get to the next. Video. No, no, no. I think you're trying. You're you're making the same kind of distinction. Like, I was drawing a similar distinction between like proselytizing and evangelizing. Um and um and I think that if people are, I mean, if people are coming to you and they're curious about your tradition, then you should speak well for your tradition, right? That's not, that's different. That, that, that is very, very different um, than like actively going out and trying to like, you know, take people out of another tradition and bring them into your own, which is what Christians have, com have totally done uh, throughout Christian history. And I'm not necessarily sure that that's, the best way to actually go about things. I have all kinds of reservations about that. Um, and, but I'll, I'll give you an example of something that I didn't. So I'll give you an example of something that I didn't find disturbing. I lost your, I lost your camera there. Has you still there? Still with you. Sorry. Okay. 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 I just lost your camera for a second. I just want to make sure we, we were still together. So I had, so when I went to, when I went and spent the Sabbath with my wife in her synagogue, I had a lunchtime conversation with an older woman who was, um, she'd been, she'd been a Jew for over 50 years, but she was, she was raised Episcopalian and she went, to, she had this, she had this for what, but she had this experience on a trip to Israel, like more than 50 years ago that made her decide she wanted to convert to Judaism. And so she went to her priest and told him about it. And her priest was actually like quite supportive and excited for her that she'd found something that spoke to her um, within the Jewish tradition. And I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't really bothered by that because it was entirely what happened with her that was entirely of her own her own discovery and her own process and and for whatever reason she found something within Judaism that spoke to her that she wasn't finding and within her own tradition now I would say that it was there in her own tradition and she just necessarily go nowhere to look but I think that um yeah that's it's a good okay. thing that she found it whatever like it's a good thing that she found it like regardless um so oh, it's a good thing that she found it regardless i think is i think that's in layman's terms that's sort of what the to me the main discussion is about at least in today's day and age which again i think is a miraculous discussion to be having which is um are we okay with the fact that people are quote unquote in the right vicinity, right? This person is, you know, trying to connect to God through Judaism. They're trying to correct through God, through, through the church. Right? When Ben Shapiro, right, is saying that like you should go to church again, these are these are these are amazing times to think of like this prominent Jew again. Forget his political leanings, just like the position he holds in American culture, and him saying a statement like that. What? A crazy world we live in where something like that could happen but that's also such a beautiful and I, I i i say this often and i will keep saying it those kind of relations of these kind of conversations is what is what powers my optimism with regards to our relationship with my, our muslim brothers because these relations also never we never thought this could happen as well and i think that also is because it's divine nature right a thousand years ago if we're talking about maimonides of no height Amani Zarenzi talks about Islam and Christianity both being pathmic, right? Both saying, ultimately, we can't deny the effect that these two religions have had on the world. And if we are people that are playing in uh, uh, God's universe, we can't ignore such great movements like this. Even if we're looking at God through 
in the lens of the God of history, right, or seeing God back, so to speak, then these movements must be uh, divine. And, and, and of course, Rambam, the Maimonides qualifies that we don't understand how God thinks and we don't, these things remain a mystery. And this is the same, these same things are echoed in a certain sense with when the Vatican comes out and says that these things re remain a mystery. Nevertheless, we should, you know, stop trying to uh, proselytize or convert uh, a Jews. And we have to understand that they could find salvation through the Torah, right? Again, these are uh, uh, um, very, very radical statements, which unfortunately I don't think have yet to um, fully, um, fully be absorbed, you know, lower down into the culture. I think part of the discussion even with, with Jacob and Yosef, and, 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 and I, I'm humbled to even mention myself in these circles, is elements of where we can see some of that happening. But, and, and I'll end this little rant with this, I, while there are different opinions in Judaism in, in, uh, in a classic fashion, uh, there are those, and, and those being like uh, uh, wide shoulders, so to speak, heavy, heavy hitters in the, Jewish, uh, in, the, in, in, in the sages, within the sages, that already see or categorize uh, Christianity as uh, being a Noahide religion, right? Maimonides at the time definitely sees uh, uh, Islam as a Noahide religion. Uh, he doesn't see Christianity at the time, but we have to put that also in context. He is not living with Christians. Uh, there is another sage named the Meiri. He does. He talks about how a beautiful, <coughs> loving relationship over there. Right. How uh, a, 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 a Jew must violate the Sabbath in order to save his Gentile brother. He talks about how, you know, ultimately the fact that they are a moral a religion that uh, that is their orientation is towards God. Should be enough. It's not for us to understand why uh, the commandments are no longer necessary for them. But these are these are mirroring opinions. I would say on on the Jewish end, roughly this was happening thousands of years ago or thousands of years ago. On the Christian end, uh, uh, due to uh, history, these things are unfolding right now. But mm -hmm. uh, this is a conversation again, which I could I could say that when I look at a Christian, I'm not going around and telling him off the bat at least, and we can dive into what that means later. But I'm not saying I'm like, you know, stop talking to me about Jesus. I could potentially still consider him a Noahide already. There's a difference then within, uh, if someone wants to understand about the Noahide path and what that means and what other uh, things he could take on, and that's a separate conversation. But again, I'm not going to someone and saying, you need to now be someone completely different. Right, yeah. Um, so, um, I, I, I'm just in this for the sake of like just on like transparency here. I have a much harder time with Islam personally, like for me as a Christian. And the reason I have a much harder time of Islam is like, let me actually let me share. I'm going to actually share a little passage from Tomberg first just to contextualize this. Um, uh, come on, cooperate with me. Okay, there we go. All right, this is from Tomber. This is from Meditations on Batero, uh, letter 14 on temperance. Uh, he's, uh, he, right before this, he's talked about a bit about uh, the gift of tears in the context of the Zohar. And then he says this. He says, Therefore we owe to, to this people not only the Bible, not only Christ in the flesh, and not only the work of the apostles, but also the gift of tears, warm and sincere, which is the vivifying fluid that emanates from contact with the image and the likeness in us. Anti-Semitism? Good Lord. Ought not elementary gratitude suffice to grant a pla the place of honor at the table of European culture to the Jews, or rather to humbly ask them to accept it, since this place is due to them by human and divine right? Honor thy father and thy mother, says the divine commandment, and provided that we are not illegitimate children or foundlings, who, who are our spiritual parents? Whom are we bound to honor, if not the Jews? But I believe that in writing these things, I am acting like a man who wants to force an open door. For I cannot imagine that your sentiments, dear unknown friend, are not identical to mine in this matter. So, so like that, and that very much, that very much is how I feel in relation to Judaism. Like to me, that's just evident. But Islam seems to exist 
for the purpose of denying the incarnation. Like that's it's that is like why it exists. It's a Christian heresy at its core. I can't so I can't I cannot because it become because it comes after Christianity in history and because so much of its content is explicitly geared toward denying an incarnation in such so radically so focused on the transcendence of god that i think that it's it it would be a problem even from a jewish perspective i think because it's so focused on the transcendent aspect of divinity while at the same time being so politically focused in its earth mission which is like the worst of all possible things to have a disincarnated ultimately super transcendent theology and at the same time be hyper focused on the political realm is the worst of all possible worlds now i will grant exception there are exceptions there are definitely like there are some sufi mystics who i think are like definitely cooking with gas and are onto something else but that is not but but that is not a, that is not the dominant strand in, in in global Islam. So it's hard for me. It's hard for me. But maybe but maybe my understanding of Islam is deficient, which I'm perfectly willing to grant because I basically I basically know no Muslims, and my reading of Islamic theology is incredibly limited. Okay, so like you just said, both of us are sort of uh, uh, you know speaking out uh, you know out of what is it out of school? I think that's the term. <laughs> no, my, my, this is my, my side is, is coming out. Um, uh, okay. My point being that, uh, you know, we have to tread carefully because um, you know, there's only so much we know about this culture. Well, I would say this, though, Hezzy. The one thing we can say for sure is that the, the, Hebrew, script, the Hebrew scriptures are the one thing that we all share. Right. But so just like okay so however i have two different fronts over here i have to deal with my christian brothers right who a i have to de uh, deal with their uh, new testament and b i have to deal with their interpretation of my testament mm -hmm. and i have to deal with the muslims who yes i they see my testament however they challenge my they challenge the testament i call my testament right they have a tarif which they say is you know, we swapped it, we changed it, and they mm -hmm. have their, their, excuse me, their Quran, Hadith, and their Surah. Now, I think just like in Christianity, um, there were the uh, Crusades, right? Uh, we have to understand that we have to be patient and fair with our uh, sister uh, religion. Now, mm -hmm. as far as Yishmael's mission, of uh, not, uh, uh, notifying the world and promulgating the unification of God across the world, they did a fantastic job, right? I mean, like, Islam is out there. They're doing their thing. All of us in the world are very, very aware of this. And that's why I also think all these, you know, we talk about these tensions in the world. These are obviously more than cultural. They're also obviously religious and theological undergirding uh, elements. That if we don't address that, they'll, they'll keep coming up. But we Either don't. Way. We, we nev almost never want to face that, though. Uh, Which is what came up in our last conversation. It's like, we want to keep ignoring this. Like, to me, it's like, we should, like, to me, like, the most important conversation to have in trying to understand how, how we can start to talk to each other is to... We need to deal with the competing the competing notions of what the meaning of Messiah is. We have to address it directly. So at I, some point. So, uh, by the way, agreed, and that is very much ulti ultimately when you know we use the term like brave space. To me, it, it ultimately ends at those kind of questions. Yeah. Right? Like and I know like this is very much like where like Anselman and Plebeus and like. We want to also know, like, you know, are we just using words? Is this kumbaya? Like, we have to be able to honestly understand, you know, who we are and what we're dealing with. Specifically, going back to a moment about, about Islam. So, the the head of the organization that, that I, I work for, it sent out a letter to around 6,000 different addresses in the, in the, in the Muslim world. And he, he wrote over there saying that, 
um, uh, in short, obviously, that uh, we are looking to have a dialogue. But ultimately, in your in your um, hadith, which is sort of like let's say the Talmud, there's different opinions over there. There are some that see the Jew as Yehud, which is hated, um, uh, uh, seen as as you know low class, and there's Bnei Israel, this noble people of ancient time, right? And there is these disagreements between us. We need the Muslim world to recognize us as Bnei Israel. We have come back to our land, and that's who we are. Recognize this and understand this to be a fact. Number two, a conversation about Tahrif, that we have a fake Torah. We can't have a conversation if that's what the conversation is going to be based on. Number three, we have no problem, in theory, seeing and accepting Muhammad as a prophet, Now, which to me is, is very important to understand the nuance you need for that and to live in a world where me as a Jew or my kids could grow up talking to another Muslim and say, Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the kind of respect that would also show between two of the people. But however, we can't accept that he's here to replace Moses. Um, and lastly, we offer, and we say our Christian brother offer to the Muslims, uh, hundreds of years ago, 400 years ago, you had a uh, method which allowed you to uh, reform the, the, the sacred text while, while maintaining their sacred status. And the Christians, through the church fathers and their traditions, and the Jews and the Israelites, have that tradition and still know how to do that and are, well, are willing to do that with you, which will allow you to take this, your religion, your facet, your understanding of the divine, and allow you to a, a start evolving that conversation again, where the Sufis and the mystics could start having that conversation again where we left off. Um, but that requires, of course, a very brave, uh, a, a very brave movement from the Muslim world. Now, in Saudi Arabia, and the Emirates invited the rabbi over to speak. Now, they had a conversation with him, and he was uh, quite surprised with their attitude. Having said that, this is while a loud it's a loud minority. It's still a minority within the Muslim world. And that's why I'm not imagining this is thing that's happening within one day. But this is a conversation, again, on the flip side that you just read to me about seeing them as a mother and father relationship. And uh, th this is all a new language that has been hidden and, and no one has talked about for a very long time. So we have to get... It's also okay to be in this space for a while, which means I don't have to yet jump into like, what exactly do you mean when you say Messiah? Because, right. um, you know, we could start playing with interpretations that maybe the last, the last Imam, Imam Mahadi and Jesus and the Israelite Messiah, all those are end up being one person and we're talking about it from different languages. I am much, I much rather be right now in a space where these religions could start having a conversation because ultimately all of us are in service of the Father. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I think that actually that that I think that's a good segue to like touch upon the the Jensen essay um, because this is this is the, the reason that I wanted to to share that with you is that oh hey that's my wife. <laughs> the reason I wanted to to share that with you is that like Jensen is like very, does not shy away from the fact that. Um, Jesus like is rightfully not viewed as the Messiah that Israel is expecting from the Jewish point of view in that essay and that um the the idea that Jews should 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 continue in anything other than their Jewish identity until that is realized is not reasonable Right, I, I think that was a very, you know, obviously it's it's uh, fascinating to to read and see how from from his from his point of view, all of this all of this theological acrobatics is required of the Christian, not of the Jew in this case. Yeah, right? Jew is still very much like the, uh, you know, stay your lane and. Uh, on the flip side, I'm well, it's from I would say it's from a standpoint of humility, though, because he's like he's saying that like we, Christians are obligated to view Judaism in this way, like whether or not it can be reciprocated, like this is just like this is what Christian theology demands of the Christian, 
essentially is his is his claim and so it doesn't it doesn't it's there's no so there's no condition like my my acceptance of judaism as an other valid path is not there's no there's nothing conditional about it like god in because god's promises are final god's promises can't be altered and what other position could i possibly hold without making my own theology incoherent Okay, so so that's ultimately what uh, you know through the blessing of, of Pope Francis, I guess that's what the Vatican in 20, 2015 ultimately gets to that conclusion as well. My question, I would be interested though, how prevalent is that? Is that mindset? Do you think? Like, how prevalent do you think that is in the TLC and 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 this to the hive mind? Well, that's an interesting question to me, Hazzy, because I think it was when Jensen wrote that essay in the mid 90s, that was the growing consciousness like throughout most of Christianity. Like there was a that was kind of the growing consensus. However, however, lately, at least on the Internet, at least on the Internet, I see definite signs of a reversion particularly amongst conservative Eastern Orthodox and conservative Catholics toward a much, toward an older, much more supersessionist conception. And I, and, and here's the weird thing is I think I see it coming from people of both very progressive political outlook and people of very conservative political outlook. So it's not, so it seems to like, it's a, this weird thing where it's like progressive Christians and conservative Christians of a certain bent will like come together in agreement on a bizarrely, re from what I see as a reactionary supersessionist theology that actually moves Christianity backward. Okay. Um. <laughs> Now, when you ask specifically about TLC, I don't... Uh, TL I, I want to qualify that with, I I only feel love in the TLC. Okay? Yes. I've never, I've never once felt... Now, that doesn't mean that someone can be saying, like, I'm not looking right now, like, in TLC fashion, to tell Chazi, like, you know, you got to convert, and this is going to save you. Ultimately, that's what I think is going to happen, but I'm not going to say anything about that. There's a difference with... And I, I, I guess... Between that and between, I guess when I say right. for my side, when I say as a, when I say as in my religion, Judaism, right, has in its toolbox, right, a a. Uh, I think Phlebas just nailed it right there. The war has an, uh, has an effect. Well, which hasn't really crept into the TLC. Uh, yeah. I hear that. Um, it's on the outskirts, though. It's on. T it's on. It's on TLC Twitter and hasn't made itself into the live streams yet. Is 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 ultimately in Judaism, right? The the, the, the attitude is right, um, and di different than Islam, which is God is everything, more than everything is God, and mm. however. There's the oneness of God. Right? Well, that matters, though, has he? That's And it's also the, it's the same sticking point I have with it, too. It's like it's too much on the transcendence. It's like it's not an act. It, it, it's like it's... And, and, I, and, and it's really weird because you would think if you have... It, it's weird, really weird that Islam seems to assert itself so much through the political in combination with having a super transcendent view of of god because that is actually kind of inverts what your expectation would be usually one would expect if one has a super transcendent notion of god that you would tend to like spiritualize like over spiritualize and be very dis not concerned with the things of this world but somehow islam is like both making god super transcendent and being hyper concerned with political control at the same time which is weird well i think like the the um... There's a, like the fact that the nations of the world will be blessed through you to Abraham 
the fact that it sees it as nations and other nations automatically frames it in some sort of political frame because you're talking about a world of nations. The question is, and this relates to Israel as far as like also taking a king onto itself, I, I don't necessarily think like politics as in democracy is the answer. However, there is a sense which is we are supposed to utilize the, the tools and the rules of the game that we as humans can play with. And it seems like uh, 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 politics so far has been one of those very, very productive tools. The question how that relates you know, that divorce that happens in Christianity between a uh, render what to Caesar is Caesar's, right? In Judaism, you don't necessarily have that. That doesn't mean that what happens, the nation, the current state of Israel, right, is not, right, what we're talking about. Okay? Now, while I have my own uh, messianic uh, 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 viewpoint of what the state of Israel is, that's not what I'm coming to say is, you know, that's what the, God, uh the, the, the Jewish people or God had in mind. Nevertheless, the fact that there is a state is something that is very much in in uh, Jewish, uh, or the political is definitely something in Jewish uh, thought. I would, I would also stress, though, that there are modes for this. There is, uh, there are the, the, the Israelites or under the name Jacob. There is Israel in its national form, which is under the name Israel and its kingdoms and past, and there is Jeshurun, which is its universal uh, uh, face, which that starts, that has to do with, you know, the, 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 the prophecies in Zephaniah, and that has to do with uh, all of us together at the temple. And in mm -hmm. that case, that's where the Noahide becomes relevant, or the god fearer becomes relevant. And that doesn't mean that that god fearer, if he comes from a Hindu background, and the God fear that comes from a Christian background, again, in my view, both of them are still expressing and have those flavors. I, I we believe in Judaism, nonetheless, that through the prophetic uh, 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 traditions that we've had, we are the chimney queen. That's it. We are there to offer uh, proper uh, orientation towards the divine, but. Mm -hmm. We are aware that God has many, many people and many, many different narratives, and there's different languages happening. So, again, as part of that uh, Noahide path, the attitude is that there's, uh, and, and I would also just start stress is the difference between the collective and individual. Uh, it, it, the sages talk about the difference as well, which is because there's a stress between what's the difference between then a Jew and then a Noahide, between the priestly class. And, and let's the rest of the nation. So again, there's nothing genetic, of course. There's just, just like there are different experiences for a, uh, a man and a woman or different experiences between an adult and a young child. There's different experiences for a priestly class. That doesn't mean that an individual Jew and an individual Gentile can't, can't have still the same relationship with God. And Maimonides talks about how an individual, if he wants to, can reach the holiest of holies and he reached the highest levels connected to God. As a nation, we look for one point of orientation. But um, but that's not to negate in any way from let's say, you know, when you your your experience right now, your Christian experience and your church, just like quote unquote Ben Shapiro was saying, my attitude to anyone that would come to me now and say, like, am I doing this? My attitude is yes. If a no hide now comes to me and starts asking more, it says, like, what more can I do to connect to God? At some point, there could be a discussion, which is, do you still feel like you need these, um, uh, these uh, the way in Judaism would see it, different uh, uh, mediators, so to speak, or can we create a unification where this is not necessary anymore? And you could in response say, Chazi, what I call the Trinity, or what, quote, unquote, the layman, when they interpret what these terms mean, yes, it sounds very much like, like auto worship. However, there's a sense where it really all becomes one again. And then it could be that just we humans just still can't comprehend this fully. And maybe all those things intertwine. However, currently, from our understanding, from Jewish understanding, it's not that two powers in heaven and conversation like this weren't around the Jewish milieu. Having said that, ultimately, 
Jesus gets rejected not because of the things that he said, because, you know, the, how things turned out in history, it seems like he wasn't the right guy. It seems like it didn't end up working out for him from our point of view. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean, right, that all that has been built around that and the, the divine story around that doesn't carry a tremendous amount of weight and can't and should still be used toward the, you know, the sanctification of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a lot there. Yeah, that was a lot. That was a lot. I don't even. Uh, so, I'm just. I'm trying to decide what part of that I want to uh, respond to. And um, I think that um, the part I want to, the part I want to respond to in that is the um, that that he wasn't the right guy. And that, and clearly from the the type of messianic um, uh, appearance that is that is that, that that Jews are awaiting, that is that's that that's that's definitely the case. And Jensen is quite clear about that. Um, but here's what I would offer, and I've, I've, I've told you this before, but here's what I would offer. I would say a couple things. I would say, first of all, um, that I believe that that expectation that Israel still has is, is in the collective and not in a single individual person. It's a it it, it it is it is a it is a collective realization that is coming. So and I think that is the same thing when 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 Christians talk about eschatologically like Christ being all in all, they're talking about that same collective realization. Like that is the final the final messianic realization that will bring the kingdom so it is undeniably present is collective. But, and here's what I'll say, and here's, here's where my point of view returns to being fully Christian, is Sorry, that... Before you do the but, can you just dig it a little deeper with, the, with that difference? With what do you mean by, by the collective? I mean that there's a way in which humanity, like God, is also, is, is also a multi-unity. We are, we are simultaneously each separate hypostases, separate individuals, and yet we are also one. You sure? Um, yes. Okay. Right? So I and I think I, I and I think this is an idea we share. Um you you would use the name Adam and I would use the name Christ, but ultimately we're talking about the same thing. The same divine reality, which is the yeah. revelation of the divine reality that is also in us. <laughs> sure. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. So, and so that's what. So ultimately, like Christ is. What when when I talk about Christ, I'm yeah. talking about the revelation of the divine humanity. And so all I'm and all I would all I would insist upon from my own Christian point of view is that although I'm willing to grant that the kingdom has the kingdom has not been realized. That Christ, Christ announced the the coming of the kingdom, but the church arrived instead. What I would say is that for any for any universal to happen, it needs to be particularized in an individual, and so Christ is Christ, and specifically his resurrection is the sign that this has been, that what will happen universally all in all has already been particularized in this one servant of Israel, which is essentially what, Je what, what Jensen says in the essay too. Actually, in fact, I think I have, I think I have, uh, where's the, uh, I have several quotes highlighted. I wanted. I like the way Jensen said it because Jensen said it in a way that still that still recognizes um, the the fleshly nature of it and the indebtedness that there is for to Israel for what I'm talking about. 
with so regards, e with even regards so even that so even that particularly even that particular Christian claim is still in many ways indebted to Judaism. So for even being comprehensible. I'm think I'm I'm just I'm I'm thinking about this. No problem. But th the question, of course, is the question is. Um, if these are these are two realities, right, so to speak, that could be that could be again, like I said earlier, could be evolving at the same time. The, the question really is, is, like you said, like you know, who this Messiah is, and, and and it's not really our responsibility to know this, right? We, we we don't have to have the pressure necessarily to like find how these things end because we'll, we'll please God we'll all be there, but but. Um, the question is how both of these can be held at the same time, right? And I wonder to myself if, if again, in in the in the Christian, I'm trying to think of how to say this without sounding disrespectful. No, yes. no, that's fine. Go ahead. Um, say it as bluntly as you want to say it. I think that'll be the most productive because I, the, I, I think I'll, because that'll be the most because if you do that. But I think it'll make the easiest for me to wrap my head around it. Right, but I, I guess the space that I, 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 and and you know, ultimately, I'm born into a certain context, and I, while I, as I, uh, yeah, we don't have to get into the whole. And thing. And, and, and just to be very clear, just like in case, like everything about the framing of this conversation to make, and I'm not asking you to change that context, I because I don't think like here's the thing, it's like to me, it's like, like the. <sighs> The love of Christ and identity of with Christ is not in competition with any other identities or any other loves. Otherwise, he wouldn't, or otherwise, Christ would not be what I understand him to be. Now, now the reason it, it ultimately, like in a in a certain sense, I'm okay with that statement because in my in my mm. in my mind, what I hear is ultimately you're talking about the Father. Now you could come and tell me like, no, 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 like I'm breaking this down into these three different hypotheses and right but there are unit but they are all really, like the first part of like the first part of our creed is is the is an expression of the unity so we're holding the unity still too understood i mean again but it's this weird kind of unity it's this weird kind of unity that does mm -hmm. not that is not in competition with multiplicity i i i also i also understand that and all i know you do <laughs> <laughs> ultimately that's why like you know that that's why you know there's there's what to play with however what i was saying about not trying to trying to not to be rude is that the way the way the way i see it the way my framing is that for that story for me to accept that narrative and that story is and again i'm basing this on on sages that these are less known. I mean, they're not less known sages. They're, they're, this work is less known, or it was censored. But it's not unreasonable for me to understand that other religions right, have their own pathway and have their own spiritual leaders and prophets. Okay? Mm -hmm. Again, my frame ultimately ends with, even if all that's true, this is a concept. This Jesus and all of Christianity is... All of it is true in the context for the Christian to understand what mm -hmm. I believe to be one, ultimately God. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. I, that's not to say like, oh, this is what the kids are playing with, right? I know that Jacob likes to use like the crayon metaphor, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's not sophisticated. However, I, my, my point being is, in, in in Kabbalah, when we talk about you know the feminine Shekhinah and these aspects, mm -hmm. we believe at some point that get misconstrued. But even if it's not misconstrued, even if these are these are true understandings, I think that they're ultimately true and limited in that realm. And I believe mm -hmm. that the ultimate reality mm -hmm. or the eschaton will come to show that one, you know, his name will be one. And you, you obviously, to your understanding, that doesn't negate the concept of the Trinity. His name will be one. And if I end up right, if we end up finding out that, like, guess what? the trinity all this is true then like woo, okay awesome then that, that also works 
But my, my, my point being... No, I'm not asking you... I'm actually not asking you to 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 assent to belief in the Trinity or anything like that. Not not at all. And that's why I'm talking... And I'm trying to talk in as generic a theological language as I can, which is why I'm talking in terms of, mul uh, uh, of a unity that is not in competition with multiplicity. Because I think that's like... I think that is actually where your tradition points to. Yes, but it's 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 the problem is uh, like the number like it could be four or five a million. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, okay, so I don't like again. I don't want to be this about like I, th here's how. Okay, this is not about convincing you of the Trinity, but here's how I would defend the Trinity as an approach to that is that that three symbolically is the minimum number that you can refer to that is not a du that that is a multiplicity that is not merely a duality. And we don't, and we don't want a mere duality because we want ultimately to be always to refer back to the unity as primary. So hence the combination of three and one is 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 a symbol of that. But ultimately, the reality that it's a symbol of is that it is the is the, as the is the divine ground as a multi unity, and that's because the divine identity is not in competition with other identities. It is both the source of their identity and their difference from one another at the same time. Right. I again, I, I, I hear that, but all what I hear also in my head is ultimately like you know there is no duality. Ultimately, it's all one. It stems from one, and and it's just I don't I don't find it necessary. I guess to to. But who am I? To but that? you exist, right? Right. Exactly. You really exist. I really exist. I am unique. There's only me. Yeah. Um. Uh. I agree. I agree. I and you agree. exist, I and you exist by virtue of the the kind of unity that is the kind of the, by God. So the kind of unity we're referring to when we talk about God is the kind of unity that somehow still created everything including all of these beautiful hypostases out there that are unique and separate and yet part of and yet part of that same unity at the same time i mean that i mean i, I mentioned this a long time ago which is that that is very much um the tension that we also see in the book of job uh, i think sherry mentioned this also i mean of course sherry mentioned this and of course just mentioned this but the tension we have in the book of Job, which is wanting to understand, you know, uh, this, the fear of this duality and trying to understand how all this is ultimately unified. How how is this good and evil ultimately unified? And I mean, that is our response when we say the Shema, when we cover our eyes, is again to remind us that while we look at the world and we see these dualities, we we close our eyes to remind ourselves that it's ultimately all one, mm -hmm. right? And that is what we're. And we say the Shema during twilight, when when we are unsure, right? We don't know what tomorrow brings necessarily. That is the time when to remind ourselves that ultimately all is one. Now, I wanna I wanna regress to progress, but uh, <laughs> just in, in our conversation, so to speak, which is what is so what is the proper etiquette? Right, like mm. I've heard this before, and I, I think it's also interesting for the TLC and for, you know, quote unquote, the larger communities out there with regards to with regards to Christian YouTube, which is how much is it a feature? Is it is the conversation with the Jew or the Jews in the in the corner? Is that a feature or is that a just like an add on? Which is, is this a Christian YouTube? And then part of the Christian YouTube, we also have to find out how we have a conversation with the Jew. Or is it a space where it's really just seekers? And that is the space where you really ultimately want to have a space where it's not necessarily predominantly Christian, but more of Christian, Muslim, Jew, Hindu, all having their discussion, trying to have a, a maybe a different kind of conversation alongside each ultimate religion right is this does this turn more into the watering hole where ideas get uh uh discussed about and then brought back into their religion right am i now taking nate's ideas and and discussing them with my children and that that way 
this version of Christianity, so to speak, right? Uh, at, at, I'm going to use this term gets uh, gets uh, you know, gets a kosher stamp, so to speak, and that allows mm. for a completely different relationship within our communities, and likewise in the other communities as well. Or is it more of a internal Christian question, which is, no, we're very much interested in this being a, you know, TLC is ultimately a Christian space, and there's space to allow conversation with Jews as well. And again, this is not in any way, I know this is also talking about me, but I'm really talking about... No, 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 that's a a really great question, and for me, it's not, for me, it's not, uh, I mean, my wife is Jewish, so for me... It's not that, it's not that level. Like I, I, for me, like the conversations with the Jews are much more important because coming, trying to understand Judaism is important to me. Um, and like, you know, it's like my feeling, my feeling like a, a connection to Judaism, like certainly pre, I mean, I think my wife is Jewish in part because I've always felt a connection to Judaism, even though I'm a Christian, um, that goes back a very long time. I, I can remember uh, there, I can remember being like, uh, 11 years old and my, the Pentecostal faith that I was raised in was not doing it for me at all i had all kinds of unanswered questions and uh you know i would <laughs> i would watch like fiddler on the roof or yentl and i would just like i'd wish i wish i were jewish you know i really would so it's like because like and part of that is because i was very into i mean i was an intellectual person and Pentecostalism is an anti-intellectual tradition and Judaism is obviously not an anti-intellectual tradition. So that was part of the appeal for me. And, you know, it's like, uh, so there's like, there's like, uh, there's always been a life, like a lifelong interest. In fact, there was a point, like before I returned to Christianity, there was a point early in my relationship with my, with my wife where she was like, she was quite worried that I would end up, that, that I would end up trying to become Orthodox Jewish, not even Christian, so <laughs> yeah, get the beer for it. Yeah, so, uh, so, uh, and, and actually, there was like some little bit of relief <laughs> on her part because uh, she's she's reconstructionist. There was some little bit of a relief on her part when I, you know, I returned to like a tradition that is like m m my own, like culturally. Um. So yeah, I'm heavily invested in it. Because it's like I, I, I mean, I like I live as closely as 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 one could possibly live with someone who belongs to another tradition. Um, and I, I shared that story earlier. I want to know what you. I can tell you I had thoughts about it at the time. The thing I said earlier on the other live stream about my observation of uh, of of the uh, the touching of the prayer books to the Torah and the uh, and and how it connects to this idea of the Torah becoming flesh and the idea of divine humanity and how, and my, and, and how, and my, and as a Christian, my conviction that what is, what happened in Christ will happen. That, that, that it's the desire of God that what happened in Christ happened in everyone. Like that's, that's what the, that's what the game is. Right. So my, uh, the, when the Torah goes around, in no, it, it really, I mean, first of all, if the Torah falls, if people are in the synagogue and it hits the floor, you have to fast. Yeah. But in no way do we see that as, like, we don't see that as flesh in any sense. Like, um, right. there, 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 uh, we, there isn't anyone like that. And even Moses, who is like the closest thing we have to like a God man, the sages do a very good job. Like, you know, we don't know where he's buried specifically for that reason that people wouldn't go there and worship him. And we we make a big effort to make sure that people realize that this is not this is not a so. But but here's the thing, Hezzy, though. Okay, you may not have like I understand that you may not have that as an intellectual concept in an abstract fashion. But what do you think you're doing when you act out the 613 commandments? 
Like, That's what you're doing. The act, you're like you're you are acting out in your mode of being the Torah becoming flesh, and one who did that perfectly, which is what Christians believe about Jesus, would have fully embodied Torah. Right. So I I I, I understand that concept. Right. Um. Uh, I understand. That, well. Okay. Let's take a step back. Okay. So yes. First of all, I can't keep all the six routine because none of them are all relevant to me, right? Like we said earlier, I'm not a woman, and some of them are really right, 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 right. Okay, um, but yes, we do believe that taking on these commandments, uh, in uh, and alongside, alongside understanding these commandments, and well, really, it's being righteous, doing justice, and and and, and giving charity, and being righteous, but what God asked from Abraham ultimately. But God is also looking for a partner. Again, it's different a little from, well, this is very different from Islam, but God is looking for a partner in this. And it's mm-hmm. also the moral Torah. This is a, a constantly evolving living tree that we're doing together with him. Um, and while we, make, while we keep these commandments, uh, it's important that we do so because we're commanded to do so as well, not because we believe that it's the right thing to do, that is also part of it, but because we are embodying this and we're doing so because God asked us to do this as well. And I would say... By the way, by the way, Hezzy, that right there is a sign of it being an expression of love. Because if you, if you are assenting to something merely because you think it's the right thing to do, that's an, that's an intellectual action. But if you're doing something because your beloved asked you to do it, and you're not bothering to think about whether it's the right thing to do, that's an act of love. Okay, so... And love ultimately is faith in action. Like, it's faith in motion. So this is, I mean, you're touching upon a like a hot nerve, right, in the Talmud, um, which is, what, what are we going to do about... Uh, um, what are we going to do about... There's a whole discussion in the Talmud, and it gets to a point where one of the rabbis says, "One of the rabbis says that a, we know that a, a Gentile could be considered get to the levels of a high priest if he does these commandments." So how can we say that the Gentiles uh, are are not also um, uh, that they don't get rewards, they don't merit from doing these commandments? And the rabbis then uh, qualify and explain that they get merit for doing it and not being commanded, and we get merit for doing it and being commanded. Right, mm-hmm. and we would come and ask, wouldn't you get more merits for doing it when you're not being commanded to do so? Right, I'm just doing it on my own will. Now, this was alluding to, and this is a conversation, and we have to understand this both as Christians and as Jews that Christianity and Judaism, in, it, at some point of their history, were also in dialogue with each other and response to each other. Yeah, so here too, you hear a response which is. Uh, the incident in Antioch, right, where people decide right now that we don't have to keep any commandments and people go buck wild over there. Comes Paul and's like, whoa, 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 you guys got to pump the brakes over here. Yes, you can't do, you, you don't have to do this, but it's proper for you to behave in this manner, right? right. However, and, and we see the Talmud is responding to this and saying, no, we do so because we're commanded to do so, like you said, out of love. And this is why it's very important for Maimonides, for the Noahide, he, he, he distinguishes between People that keep the seven Noahide laws because of they're commanded to do so through Moses, through Sinai ultimately, or I'm doing so because it's the right thing to do. And some are considered part of the uh, the, the wise sages of the world, and some are considered the right. And then there's a difference between who you know do they merit a place in the world to come. The idea being though is that here too. It's an opportunity for the Gentile, so to speak, or even the Christian, to take back and keep these commandments out of doing so because God willed you to do so, not because it's the right thing to do, or we've developed into what we call today the Christian value, uh, the, the, the Judo-Christian uh, uh, values, right? Those are not values right now, but we see them as commandments, mm-hmm. divine commandments, right? right? So this is an invitation to take that back on. Now, I would say, though, I do believe, and this is a point of tension that I have with Jacob, um, that eventually the Moses' Torah transforms or phase shifts into Messiah's Torah. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> and that Torah, and there are many conversations that allude to this throughout the sages. Again, they're all uh, uh, ideas, hints, contradictions, uh, which is beautiful. But talk about things being more strict, things being more lenient, things being not things not being necessary anymore. More things being taken on. Completely new mindset, right? If the whole world is 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 filled with his knowledge, right? What does that mean? What is practically what does it mean? And to me, this starts bumping up against our reality today with the internet, with AI, with how this transforms humanity completely. So these things start to potentially to mesh. Um, um, and uh, so even when you give concepts of someone that fully embodies the Torah and then no longer needs to necessarily uh, uh, um, uh, keep the commandment, so to speak, or he himself is an embodied commandment, I, that too is not foreign to me. The question is how it's, how it's fully articulated, how it's fully realized at the end of the day. And of course we have the tension. So like if, you know, again, there's- how Well, I would say, Hesse, here's where we can come together is that we both desire to see it fully realized. And even if we don't know how or when, we're looking for the same thing. We are look. We are we are looking for the same thing. Indeed, I think. Again, I I believe that this kind of brave space is the kind of conversation you need, because, um, again, it, it's it. These we have to all as, as as a community, as really as humanity, realize what these differences, how how impactful they were on the world history. They changed the map. They they created. They brought down dynasties. Like the whole world is, is based on, on these elements, and mm. and I really feel like we're on the front lines, so to speak, with this kind of conversation, and it really behooves us to keep having it. And I don't again, I don't know if it, it doesn't end with so so. It looks like at the end of this conversation, Nate had eighty three points and Chazi had sixty five. So <laughs> I hope um, not. Right. So, I hope not. Um, it's. It, it's it, it, really again because this is happening hundreds of years ago, or close to thousands of years ago, where there's already inklings of these conversations of love between the Christian and the Jew. But if now it could actually be realized without that tension, like we just said, going back to when I say regress to progress, going back to that point where we don't have to jump to the to the uh, end game theological, but rather be in the space where we could say we could be in the space together, right? And it could be that for Judaism, some of those tools needed are called Noahide language and Noahide path to allow things like that conversations to happen. We have to also have to be sensitive how our different communities have these conversations. Um, but, but those conversations, I believe, lead then to, to definitely more worship, more love of God, and I just don't see how that's not the right direction. I don't see how that's mm. not the point of orientation ultimately. Right. Right. Yeah. So I, apparently you won is the, is the, is the, if this was a debate, which I didn't conceive of it as being, <laughs> I don't know if you want. That's to certainly not how I was framed it. That's not, that's not how I was framing it internally. I would. Is this going like, to be? Nick I wasn't trying to convince uh, Hasley of anything. Um, so, let me ask this. Let me ask this. This is going to be a, this is going to be a hairy question. All right. So, do you see any possibility? Any pos any future possibility for someone who is someone who remains a convinced Christian to embrace Judaism in some form that would be acceptable to Jews? At what? At, give me a timeline today, or because I, I mean, because for I mean, like on our side of the equation, I don't know. There's no timeline. I'm just wondering, like, if you think, it, like, if it's even possible, like, so I think because I would say that from a Christian perspective, like, Jewish identity is not well. Okay, from <coughs> at least from the perspective of many Christians, Jewish identity is not in competition with 
identity as a follower of Christ. Like it's, they're, it's, they're not competing identities. Um, so yep, is there, is there, is there, is there a point where those, is there, is there, is there a point anywhere where those identities could be seen as not in competition from the other side as well? And I'm okay with the answer to that is no. I just, I'm curious, I just, I'm curious about it. So I have to ask the question and now I'll shut up. No, no, it's not, not at all. And, 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 uh, if I, if I, if I, um, cut you off, it's only out of love and passion. It's not like, I don't want to hear the the end of your sentence. Um, the answer is according to some schools of thought. Yes. The answer is according to some schools of thought. And according to some interpretations of what the Trinity means, okay, uh, like the monarchical, the monarchical Trinity that Jacob is like, you know, that's Jacob's baby in his conversations with Father Stephen the Young, that again to a Jew is like, you know, much like, I'm like, bring me more of that conversation all day. And like Sam, I'm like, you know, come on, Sam the Unitarian, like you're almost there, baby. So like, uh, so again, those, it's, it, so giving those those uh, caveats, um, I would say, yes, there are opinions that say that you could still maintain a relationship with uh, a, a, a Jesus figure, right, while participating in, uh, well, again, being a no hide, right, and then taking on many more of the commandments. The question then would be is, as you start keeping more of the commandments, I believe that there would start being a tension with that character at that, at that point. So it's what your, your understanding of your relationship with God would be might change. For example, you know, there's no need for salvation. There's a need for redemption, right? Like you could, you could repent at any point. I, there's no need for someone to have died for my sins. And again, what those terms mean, dying for one's sins, or one would have to, again, see what this specific individual believed in right what is it what are those terms right so i think on again on an individual basis the answer is yes um the 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 talmud talked about how or mentioned that anyone who uh anyone who uh denies idol worship is called a jew right in the sense which is like once like you're done with like the rocks and the trees and rod so basically, you're already you're basically there. So then again, the question is, how would you qualify the, the Trinity and the relationship with Jesus? And uh, so, Judaism has space for this. I should be I, just to be fair. The organization I work for now, their attitude is at this point of time. In this point of time, we're interested in people that are uh, uh, are not really interested in that interpretation right now, as in we're looking for people that are done with the relationship they have with Jesus, right? But that, may, that makes sense from the not proselytizing, but, but evangelizing. Sharing what's good in your own tradition without trying to, like, take people out of another tradition. That's like, to me, that's an appropriate stance. Um, At least for now. Exactly, and then, you know, the attitude is like, what happens in the future? He's like, once if he hits, like, you know, if I have millions of Noahides that I'm dealing with, then we'll have a conversation with uh, the people that still want to maintain a relationship with Jesus and be a Noahide. Then, like, it's it's almost like, again, like, when we'll be there, I believe those are blessed issues to be dealing with. More people wanting to be in a relationship with God but are not sure exactly how to do so, those should be our problems at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. and, and this goes all the way back to, again, in our tradition— we have the gifts that Abraham gives to the concubine's son. And that being said, that that's happening from east to east, in the far east. And our tradition says that he gives uh, the sons of the concubine uh, sequences, uh, which are called um, impure names. Growing up, that meant to me like something bad. But in reality, that just means different sequences and different frequencies. So... As, as Jews, or going back to the analogy of the chimney cleaners, we are claiming that uh, our FM antennas are the best, clearest, 
you know, quality sound out there and to anyone that deals with audio, whatever the new jargon is. So that that's the one we're thinking we're offering. We're offering 5G. We are aware that throughout history, there have been people that were playing with 3G, with radio waves, with all these different things that even Abraham himself and others played around with it. I, in, in, that, in that analogy, right, I believe that Christianity mm -hmm. has developed from a, has taken a, you know, the Jewish concept and sort of branched off into, a, into its own frequency that uh, potentially also, according to Maimonides, I can't even deny its necessity, right? If I want mm -hmm. to go to like, oh, it's nothing. I'm saying more than that. I'm saying it's clearly part of, it's clearly a frequency that is needed and was needed. And also this thing that Judaism could not have done through its exile and where it was. My mm -hmm. universal conversation, like you said, and why it may be bothering you or sounds Christian to you is because we're getting to a point in time where uh, uh, Judaism is sort of revealing itself in a certain, in a certain, uh, uh, in a certain way saying, well, like, we do have a mission that relates to all. And while our our brothers and sisters, I'm sorry, Sherry, if I was using that term that you didn't like, or let's say daughter or child, or let's say if we want to use more, the branches of our tree, Islam and Christianity, and, and Kabbalah talks about this as well, being, uh, you know, grace and justice, all these things, ultimately different branches, right? I have to recognize them as divine. I have to recognize them that they're coming from the same source. Um, and that their frequency is potent. What Judaism is offered, or the Noahide Path is offering, is uh, uh, prophetic pruning. Assuming, and this is what we believe, my context, that we still hold the prophetic tradition, we offer rel you know, relevant tuning and pruning of these trees or these frequencies to the other religion. While desperately wanting to maintain and feeling that it's necessary to maintain their own frequency nonetheless. So I'm not, you don't need to become, you don't all need to convert. You don't only become Jewish. That's not the point. And if, you know, if the 144 or the 140,000, you'll forgive me if I'm forgetting the exact number in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Christian eschatology, of this remnant of, of the people of it's 12,000 for each of these, so it's 144,000. Right, so if it's there to mean just like a small number, right, right, because that could be considered even it's like a, it's, it's, yeah, it's a symbolic number that represents the fullness. So, it, you know, so it's all of you, right? It's all of us, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know? so it, it, and, and how that relates then to like you know, a, a pure voice. Which doesn't necessarily mean again the response. We've, I've said this at nauseum, but like mm -hmm. I still think it's, I think it's important. The, the what fixing what happened in Babel was the same. They b believed all the terminology was locked down. There was no more room anymore for differences. We had it locked down, and because of that, they were sure that they could understand the heavens and attack the heavens and reach the heavens. And in reality, the pure speech is when there's a realization that there's a multiplicity of understanding. And of mm -hmm. conversation. However, it's pure because we understand we're speaking about the same thing. So that is really what I'm, uh, where, what I'm hoping to reach. And I, I hope that that kind of conversation and that language leaves or allows for enough space for the other to still be seen and not feeling like uh, I'm, um, you know, coming down on their religion or saying that it needs to be completely forgotten or replaced. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I, by the way, I, I don't even know if you want to open this up for, uh, for the people. Yeah, we can we can totally do that. Let's do that. Let's do let's do that. And then I have one more question. While we do that, hit me, hit me, hit me. Yeah, I have one more question for you. It's like, what could you tell them? Given my confessed cynicism toward Islam, which I just cannot. I mean, I'd just be lying if I wasn't. I'm very cynical about Islam, in a way that I'm not toward any other tradition, and I don't know why. Um, well, I do know why. <laughs> um, but um, what can you say? What would you say to me, like in defense in defense of Islam? What would I tell you in defense of Islam? Yeah, I mean, Israel, God, the Bible, like the exact the same thing that I just told you about my mom. Like, how can you deny its presence? Are like, you be like this is the devil? Like, but. 
in my mind, like the devil, mm-hmm. just I can say it's all mm-hmm. part of God ultimately. So like I'm saying, like this is, if I see myself as as the descendant of Jacob and I see them as the descendant of, of uh, Ishmael, just like there's a fascinating, I'm going to go back to Islam, but they're, they're when, when um, Sarah is pregnant, Jacob and Isa, uh, we say there's like there's rumblings in her stomach, and the midrash talks about the rumblings in her stomach were uh, conversations that were going to happen in the future between Judah the prince and Marcus Aurelius, and these were to be as representative of a time in history where Esau, which also is seen as Christianity, and Jacob, which is Israel, where they can meet again and uh, and can be combined. Now, I, this is true with Ishmael as well. Uh, Ishmael gets, gets um, we're upset at Ishmael because outside the tent, he laughs. However, the difference between that laugh and Isaac's laugh in Hebrew, Isaac's laugh is a laugh that will happen in the future one day when, he, when, when all is revealed. The laugh that Isaac, that Ishmael was doing was a laugh of today. Today we shouldn't really be laughing necessarily because we obviously... We're still in an incomplete world. We're still in the seventh day. The eighth day is not here. Ultimately, though speaking, Ishmael, even in the Bible, comes back to the tent of Abraham. And that's the same thing that that the angel tells Hagar. He says, return to your mistress. Uh, and by mistress, that it, it doesn't mean that you're less than. It just means recognizing, again, we're talking about different different uh, uh, responsibilities. But I believe that that has uh, still to come. Islam has given us a, a, a tremendous amount of gifts to the world, and I believe it still has, it could still do so as well. It, it requires a tremendous amount of reform, but but I think even more so, Nate, it requires people like you to be fiercely uh, pro Islam. Yes, we can't deny the fact that there's a very uh, silent uh, uh, majority, and we can't uh, uh, deny the fact that uh, uh, there's a, a, a large minority that is radicalized. Having said that, this is something that we're going to all have to deal with. And I think part of it is having honest conversations. Um, I personally had some conversations in this little corner. It's been hard for me since the war to have some of these conversations. Uh, and really just because I'm trying to be sensitive also with my Muslim brothers. But there, there is a lot of diamond over there, diamond in the rough. And mm-hmm. it does require a different language. But it requires us to... I know it sounds hard, but also speak bravely but respectfully to our Muslim brothers, and do so without without fear. It's it's an uphill battle. I can't I can't tell you like you know like this beautiful message. I can just tell you that that story is far from over, and we need to we need to roll up our sleeves and be invested just as much as we're invested here. Yeah. I see a lot of the lot. Of, there's a lot of, in the comments. There's a lot of comments about Sufism, which I acknowledged earlier, and I certainly think that there's a there's a deep connection between uh, the stories of the hidden Imam and the Grail stories, um, yep. which come out of Christian culture. And I think that they're both pointing toward what we were talking about, which is this like this the way in which this the final messianic realization that will make the Messiah as the Jewish people have always been awaiting the Messiah um, will be this realization of divine humanity, of God all in all, which is what we, which is what I understand as the whole mystery of Christ. We're living in exciting times, my friend. <laughs> yeah. I dropped but the I, link. I, I dropped the link for people to come on in if they want. Yes, everyone's welcome to, to, to join and uh, specifically because this was in the context of like Nate probing, uh, uh, being invited to probe, of course, and ask questions. Likewise, so please do not hesitate to ask, challenge. Um, you know, no, no harm. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be offended. Uh, oh, we got Sherry. The queen herself. Hey, Sherry. I'm just like itching to talk about it. Hey, this. Sherry. Hi. What's going on? <laughs> Tell us the secret. Oh, I didn't realize we've been using the Luke, we've been using the Luke logo the whole time. 
<laughs> you know, I was wondering about that. I was like, what? What happened to the <laughs> No, I, I wanted to ask Kezi what he thinks about um, the project that, um, oh gosh, now his name just went off. Uh, Seekers of Unity. Seekers of Unity. So I, I Seekers of Unity, uh, uh, Sherry's talking about Zevi Slavin. Zevi, yeah. What do you think about his project? Zebby is doing amazing, amazing. Right? Work. He sounds like a Jewish version of me. <laughs> he, you know, he, I mean, Zevi, we really do talk about similar things. Z Z Zevi <laughs> is people like this are obviously needed. It's, it, it also it requires like like um, a mix of different things. He he is really he is really a powerhouse uh, of knowledge as well. Um, and to be honest. Um, to be transparent, um, I, and this is apropos to this conversation, I am in a group with Zevi, Yosef is there, um, some other rabbis, some other uh, oh. uh, philosophers, and this is a closed group where we have conversations like once a week, but it's very much the conversations we're having here, where this is how we're having those conversations internally within our, uh, within oh, nice. our communities, but that has to happen very carefully because the things that, like I just said right now, I discussed with you right now, really, Nelly, this would be terrifying for many people in my community. Yeah, yeah. They are not ready to have this kind of conversation. Not only do they lack some of the knowledge, and again, I, I know nothing. I just say, regardless, they haven't slapped in these waters at all. So we are seeing how these conversations happen, how we speak about a, an evolving Torah, a new Torah. How do we talk about a conversation which I still have to deal with verses that are clearly very problematic with regard to my relationship with my Christian and Muslim brothers. But how do I still respect that while while bolster and frame and stress others and start creating a narrative, which is I'm teaching a whole generation of kids a different language. But we can't publish any of those videos at this time because it's still very uh, sensitive. Yeah, no, of course not. So I actually don't agree with this at all. All secrets and unity lead to Spinoza. No, Spinoza's too, uh, too abstract and disincarnated. I don't think that's, that necessarily follows at all. I think that the kind of unity that Hesse and I are both seeking is a far more incarnational and less abstract kind of unity. I mean, I would say that Zevi, if I, if my, I understand Zevi correctly from my conversations with him, and he's always evolving and growing, as we all are and as we all should. Um, while I find some, while I believe some, we'll use the word supremacy to Judaism. I don't, again, supremacy is the wrong word. No, I understand. No, that. no, 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 no. It's okay to prefer your own thing. You don't need I to apologize for that, but, has he? But, but, but I understand that. I just I think we should, we should be careful with our words. And I want to go back to what the example I said about about offering, you know, proper, you know, offering proper Wi-Fi, right, or offering proper orientation. That's yeah. what we're great. That we have the wisdom of that, or offering that. Uh, I think he believes that 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 sequence is offered to everyone at all times and everyone is at some point has reached that conclusion in some different way. Um, so he doesn't necessarily, I don't think he necessarily sees an origin point in, in Judaism. However, I believe he thinks that psychologically and culturally, ultimately we're living in our skins and we're on a certain path and he's going to play the game through the iOS, the, you know, the operating system that he's been given, he grew up with, right? So yeah. That, yeah, he that's what I understand. Through, through a Jew and through the context, through those jer that jargon, through those sequences, but, you know, he still fully sees, uh, you know, his Hindu brother as doing the same thing at the end of the day as well. Right. And he wants right. to maintain his route while I think I'm, I'm speaking a similar language Nevertheless, I still am framing it within a Jewish context. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that would be the difference. I don't know if that's uh, if, if, if I explain it. No, yeah, no. I mean, what I what I think <laughs> about when I think about what Zebby's doing is 
He's pointing us towards a mystical center at, in which we all kind of naturally coalesce anyways. Like it's not non-existent. It's there already, right? And we're, it feels to me like we often end up stuck all around the edges of our, you know, of our differences. And, but in the center that we have, we, sh we share we share almost everything, right? Well, I would say we share everything, actually, at the center. Um, and Well, yeah, and Sherry, in fact, I would say in answer to Luke's question, is Judaism better than Christianity? It's like the framing of that is all wrong because remember what I said earlier in the conversation about how Christian claims are only even comprehensible in light of, Ju in, in light of Judaism? It's like Christianity, and it doesn't matter whether Hezzy agrees with the statement or not, for, but Christianity is a Judaism. It's like, it is a form of Judaism. It just, it just is. Like, you can't, like, separate from, you couldn't possibly have a Christianity that was in, completely separate from all of Jewish thought and have anything coherent. It so may not I, be, go ahead. I, I want to agree with, I want to just touch on that and jump back to what Sherry was saying. I would agree with that and I would just frame it like I just said earlier, which is that's why some see Christianity as already being categorized as a Noahide path because we see it just as another path, oh. which I ultimately stems from Judaism. So, you know, I would be in agreement with you. With regards okay. to what Sherry was saying, though, I think it's, it's a very important point and I think it also touches about what we're doing in the TLC. Yeah. Um, so, what Zevi is doing right and pointing out to this to the center right to this to this point that we all call us around he's also saying at the end of the day our all our religions have dogma or, or have systems built in which say like you know don't stray or don't do x or because if we don't use those terms and definitely over over the millennia if we don't use those terms it would be a complete frame right ultimately if you push and shove if you go to those mystics you end up finding there really everything was a lot more loosey goosey. And this is okay, and that's okay. But they're speaking to the masses and they're speaking to the individual as well. There's right. what I what how can I teach my son about his relationship with God and the commandments? Mm -hmm. And then what I hope my son will realize about the commandments as he gets older and the freedom he he will have within that. And then he too will have to then deal with how I explain that to his son as well. Now, my point being, which is why we're not we're not advising people to just leave their religion, right, and just jump ship to other religions necessarily, while still maintaining a door in all religions. We're saying that ultimately, like Nate was saying earlier, if his friend found his way to convert to Judaism, right, that's not something he's going and telling all his kids in his community to do. However, he still understands that she found her path to God ultimately through her own route. Now, in in Judaism, there's something called um, uh, the, the daily, the daily paid, which is everyone or, or, or many Jews participate in this, which is they all learn across the whole globe the same page of the Talmud. And within seven years, you finish the whole Talmud and everyone has a big celebration. Okay. And the and, and this is like uh, Christian Baxter was talking about, about after seven years of all of us being on this online space, taking in all this information. And some of us who are involved with just general reading have been taking this on. We needed a space where this could actually come out, where the conversation could actually start being had. And I think after all these years of having these conversations, whether it's Tom Berg or, 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 or McDonald, you know, coming from all these different places, we start realizing, and this is these daily chats, which is like I say, a modern day Talmud, we want to be on the same page. And we all mm. realize that if we keep on talking and we keep on talking, where those differences start to disappear and we start realizing we're talking about the same center. We're talking about the same page. Yeah. And we, if we could see if we're all on the same page, still while maintaining a, 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 a point of processing, we ultimately build ourselves up. So I think that Zevi is doing that very yeah. much in, in a beautiful, beautiful way. Uh, I think he, his crowd specifically are seekers more in like the new age place that are coming from him. Uh, mm -hmm. Less Christian, but um, I could be wrong about his demographic. No, yeah, I've noticed that too. Um, 
Oh, shoot. I had a bunch of thoughts while you were talking. No, I lost them all. Well, I certainly get a lot of flack uh, from my fellow Christians for the way I talk about stuff, too. So I can kind of identify with uh, with that to a certain extent. Yeah. About you? About, no, about just the way I talk about, uh, uh, about, about what I see Christianity as being. Like, right, so um, how, how fringe, this is true about the TLC, and Sherry can tell me this as well. When you talk about uh, TLC, hello, Sam, I hope all is well. When you talk about TLC um, not being a Christian space, how fringe is TLC? I know people talk about it being fringe, but like, for like, for Christians, you mean? For Christians, exactly. Which is like well, it's, I ver go it's very fringe, very fringe right. for Christians. Yeah, yeah, mm. totally fringe. I think so. Yeah. I think that everybody feels a little bit of trepidation. You know, um, I mean, I don't know. I I don't. Have you read our comments, Essie? <laughs> <laughs> Particularly when it comes to Grail Country, like. You know, there are a lot of people who are not too happy about what we do. Yeah. And those same people that don't like what we normally talk about are not going to like this conversation either. Because they're going to feel that I have, because they're going to feel that I have not insisted enough on the importance of Christian particularity. Right. So, so then I, then my question would be, what is, what is Paul? Vanderclay. Oh, I Tepper. just remembered what I wanted to say. I just remembered what Do I wanted that to first. say. I just want to say this really quickly because Luke in the live stream this morning, because I went back after and listened to it, and um, he was talking about his daughter saying to him, um, you know, Dad, what, da Dad, I, you know, I have this and that and the other thing. What should I do? And he, he you know, he gave her some kind of philosophical you know, package. And she just was standing there with his, all his words and looked at him and said, yeah, but what, what should I do? Right. And I think, yeah, I yeah, think, yeah. I think that, um, like when you're talking about all these religions outside of like all of the differences outside on the fringe, as I described it. And, and yet there is a center in which we can all coalesce. The, the, the utility in that in that fringe is daddy what can i do right and and because we 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 are such a large family humanity we are such a large family there is no way on god's green earth that we're all going to know the same thing about what to do right when it comes to living a good life and being a good person mm -hmm. and so we're all going to develop our own philosophy or even religions about, you know, to answer that question, what should I do? Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and so it seems to me that, and, you know, I mean, I'm accused of being, you know, too perennial or, you know, that, that, that's, that's such a passive stance. Um, but I just don't, I don't see any other way for us to understand each other unless we see each other as a family that, that has developed their own ways of how to be in the world um, in a way that is pleasing to God. Because we, this is the one thing that is universal to humanity. We know that there is a higher power, that we know as a human race that there is a God and and so we want there i would say the vast majority of people want to live a life that is worthy of that calling right mm -hmm. and and so we 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 have made made um we have developed ways to answer the children's question what should i do yeah right. but we have a tendency to want to oversimplify those answers though right so i was oh, thinking 
you you mean the Sunday school class as a Sunday school answer? Well, I mean, and I think I think this is adults want. We as adults want to oversimplify our answers well, did, too because did I, it, did I just oversimplify? No, it? not at all, not at all. I think I what I saw you doing is opening an invitation to like. What I, I saw you what you do what I saw you doing was opening an invitation to like what is the right way to answer this question and I think sometimes that we I mean obviously when you're dealing with a child you have to like give some kind of answer but it can I don't know if we're doing our children any favors if we give them an overly simplistic answer and portray the world as having less complexity than it really does. Let me give you an example, like an example of this, of this occurred, that occurred to me today. This is about my own like contradictory self, honestly. So Kale, Kale Zeldin like had this tweet about like how no one will, no one really won World War II, everyone lost. And there's a way, there's a level on which if there, that I know that that's true because it's almost always true of any war. But at the same time, there's like a part of me, there's a part of me that, you know, my, you know, my, my old neocon self that has a, you know, appreciation for John Wayne's communist domination of the world speech and his 1968 Green Berets that, that really, really still is a, finds that narrative of of uh you know of, of the of the american mythos and the mythos of modernity as being highly appealing so and and one of the reasons they're appealing is because it reduces the complexity of the world for me if i know that america is the good guy and fighting for you know truth and justice and democracy in the world then I have reduced the complexity of how the world appears to me in a way that is psychologically comforting, but probably not true. So Kale's, st Kale's statement that no one really won in World War II that we all lost is more true, but it's not a very, but it's not very comforting. Well, you know, the thing is, <laughs> I've, I've talked to, um, cradle orthodox who reject orthodoxy about something similar to this in the sense that they they rejected it because it it was it was too oversimplified right and, and to a certain extent <coughs> they found that they they discovered that you know as they moved in, out into the world and they you know went to college or whatever they discovered that a lot of what they saw growing up in an orthodox setting was superstitious you know and I and and I I think that this actually ties in to what we're talking about because I think that there is a there is an element of human nature that will, in order to make things digestible and easy to do, we we will we will reduce them down to um, certain factors, and then those factors can get reduced down to superstition, to a certain extent, even if we don't want to uh, even if we don't want to admit it. Okay. And, and, um, and I guess that's just the way we are. Like, that's how I would, how I would put it. But there are people, there are other people, people like Zebi, people like Kezi, people like Neat, right? Who want, want to go, want to look at this, take it a step further or, or maybe go down a level deeper, right? or as I would put it, move closer towards the center, away from the edges, right? Where all the extremities, where all the extremeness happens within Christianity, within Judaism, and within Islam and Hinduism, right? Um, so, and, and I used the example today of, of Job, how he became a mediator because of, a, because of an evolution of consciousness, right? Because he was able to come face to face with God. He was able to say, I have heard of you, but now I have seen you. And when that happened, he mediated people up a level. Okay. So like, I don't think that any of this happens without having an impact on the world. 
you know that's why i keep talking about sacred magic right when and, and i know that's going to ruffle everybody's feathers but ruffle away you know ruffle away people because when we speak this stuff into the world it doesn't come back void and we can help people we can mediate this evolution of consciousness that level levels us up right it's this further up and for this spiral that we're in so anyway I'll i stop. i want to just um i want to respond to that but sandy uh yeah i was just gonna you like to mention yeah. or thank you for joining us sandy Sorry, it took so long for you to get a chance to say anything. <laughs> Sandy? I want to hear Did you want to say something, Sandy? I want to hear your Kedzie's response. You want to hear my response? Uh, um, it was just specific, about, about Job, what you said, I think, is, 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 it's fantastic, Sherry, um, and it's also a response to the to the, to the sterile circle, party circle that the children are having at the beginning of the book. Right? Yeah. Every week, his kids are having this party, but there's no reason for this, and you could see his tension in you know, sacrificing these these uh, yeah. weekly sacrifices, which is like I just I, I know this is going nowhere, but I don't know how to face this. I don't know how to go deep. Right, so that whole story is from getting to that point, point. and like you said, it, you know, relates going back to Moses, right, in the cleft of the rock, and that goes back to Moses saying, ultimately realizing Moses saw God's face, like seeing a fellow man, seeing his face in a fellow man, right, which is re realizing that obviously that's within us as well. Um, so, but but simplifying things, just to Nate's point, it's it, you know it's. It's difficult because we don't, you know, with children specifically, these are, these are very, very complicated. These are complicated ideas. Mm -hmm. And, and at some point, you know, even, even God, God himself tells Job, right? Like, where were you when I created the universe, right? There's only so much we could, uh, we could, we could comprehend. Um, again, I think some of this dovetails with AI and, and how that's going to change some things, but. Generally speaking, I think that, I mean, you know, and this relates to, uh, you know, to Jonathan Bajot and to Jordan Peterson with regards to symbolism and all, you know, all these archetypes and what they mean, like, they, they are tremendously powerful. And we should be very careful when we, when we get rid of these, uh, these myths, so to speak. And that's why when Sherry, Sherry uses the word magic, I feel like going back to a more enchanted time is potentially necessary right to 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 come back to these these concepts which uh which carried a lot of weight and, and and their flexibility with with the terminology and their concepts being a little more abstract a little more magical a little more mystical are some of the benefits we can get from postmodernism and its breakdown of narratives and concepts which allows us a little to play around with those waters. Again, one has to do that very carefully because much of that, uh, much of that philosophy is completely corrosive. Yeah. Um, Sandy, that was my response. <laughs> you wanted to add anything, Sandy? Maybe I'm still thinking. Okay. Yeah, you know, I, I, Kelsey, one of the things I keep thinking about is Jacob. Jacob has talked about this many times, and when he does, he tears up every time, and I just love it. When he talks about um, the people, I think it's, I don't know the, the story properly, but the people saying to the rabbi that they want to hold on to his tzitzit, right? His fringes. Yeah. Right. Right. And so, like this, this, this thing is called toward a Christian theology of Israel. But I, I want to, I want to turn it around and say toward a toward a Jewish theology of Christianity. <laughs> That's what okay. I want to do. Right? <laughs> because yeah. well, I, I would rather let a Jewish person do that. <laughs> but <laughs> well, I think this is something that Christians should be asking themselves. 
I did kind of ask that question of Hazzy earlier. Did like yeah. when I asked yeah. him, I was like, "Do you see a point at any point where where Christian identity and Jewish identity would be in non competition from a Jewish point of view, the way it is already from the point of view of many like there are many Christians for whom that is not the case who would not feel that way, but there are also a lot of Christians, including the Pope of Rome." And the Roman Catholic Church who would view that as not in competition. So Well, I, I, I prefaced all that with, with hanging on to the fringes of, of the rabbi's prayer shawl, right? Because mm -hmm. that is essentially what we're all doing. <laughs> well, I mean, all, that, the, that, all of the Abrahamic faiths are doing that. They're hanging on to that the fringes of that prayer shawl. I'd want to ask the, the, I would really, like, I wanna I wanna ask the person whose fringes they are, whether we're doing that or we just think we are. Yeah, that's what I think because he was going to answer. Um, that uh, it, and if you, I, I don't know if you don't mind opening it up, Nate. Uh, the Jensen, uh, the Jensen article, I think on page fifty-three. Uh, okay. It talks there about there's something there about uh, how you know to read it through the Jewish lens, I believe, and reading it through a, a Christian lens, like that obviously brings up, you know, holding it on the fringes and what those fringes symbolize, right? And then Jacob, first of all, Jacob is quoting a verse in the prophets, I believe. Um, okay. I'm forgetting which verse right now, but um, I'm, yeah, I'm embarrassed. I'm forgetting which verse it is, but um, the question would be, the verse. Uh, uh, according to Jacob, he would say that, um, right, the, the, the the Masora and the 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 tradition that we have with the tradition that I'm claiming right is the proper interpretation right so when we're looking at terms like the son of man when we're looking at Isaiah and we're looking at all these terms should we be reading them through a Jewish lens and then should and this relates to sort of Nate what you were talking about which is if you're talking about this mother father uh, parent relationship and if you're talking about the Seeing it to, to responding to to, uh, to Luke is like Judaism better than Christianity. Rather, you know, Christianity is being read through Jewish eyes. Then would you not interpret it through the sages? How much weight are we giving the church fathers? How much weight are we giving the fact, like the historical context of the fact that a tremendous amount of Greek influence, you know, came into the church? And then started interpreting its text through a Greek lens, right? Like, and now that that's fact, do we just ignore that? Do we decide that, like, well, it is what it is, and that's we're continuing down that line? Or, and and I mean this, to me again, these are these are miraculous signs, right? When I hear Sherry say a line like, "I heard that you know that Yosef or Hezi were talking about that, you know." Her interpretation of Job is now influenced a little by Jewish thought, right? If I hear when I when I heard Jordan Peterson giving his biblical series and top down, right, or coming to his coming to his own understanding of what these verses mean that that aligns with sages that I've been reading from like thousands of years ago, like to me that is like you know that is a data point, so to speak. However, you have to decide in theory for yourself is that something that you could do together with or do you sort of need to pick a link well you so, know to be honest to be honest because years and years ago i was 20 22 at the time and um and a jewish man said to me you know that the book of isaiah wasn't written to you right <laughs> and i was like and i was just really young and dumb and i i, I was like really he goes, no, it wasn't, wasn't written to you. And, 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 and I remember thinking at the time, wow, because it felt, I felt the weight of, of centuries of arrogance just kind of weigh down on me, right? Um, and it wasn't like a just social justice warrior cultural appropriation moment, you know, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but it it was also it also revealed to me my own the well not even my own but the the utter naivety of 
what I thought I believed in, right? Like the 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 kind of Christianity that I was that I would that I had ascribed to. And um and it and it's really what propelled me, you know, um onto a more onto a more um onto a deeper journey into these things. And at this point in time, because of this little corner and getting to know you and Yosef and Jacob, I don't feel like I have the right to talk about certain things without some kind of Jewish background knowledge on 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 it, on the subject. Um and and I will say this, um, it's not always easy to get. <laughs> Just say it. I know I've also, I, I've been I've been, uh, I've, <laughs> I've been I've been missing, but uh, but um, I also can't compete with like uh, Encyclopedia Brown Yosef over there. He's just like I don't know I don't know where he stores all that information. He's great. But uh, but, um, but again, like sentences like that to me are just they're like bombshells. Right, like sentences like that. Again, like I said, the fact that Father Stephen DeYoung is sending his book to Jacob to like to like look and give his comments on that to me is just like I don't know, like that's why I think you know we're at the we're at the you know we're at the end of days. We're at the 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 time uh, or you know, we're at yeah. the the times of Messiah. Just because like that's that is a kind of language uh, that is a kind of understanding. And and in no way, Sherry, I want to like I I I'm not saying I don't want to sound like I'm saying like oh Sherry now she's finally seeing the light. And, uh, <laughs> no. uh, it, it's it's more of all of us, both of us. Yeah. Um, both of us realizing that in a in a body. Um, and we, I, I mentioned this in uh, in uh, the stream earlier about like two separate hands, which is like we're not the same. But like they could be folded in with each other, and once right. we, we to for Christians to understand to understand themselves better, they have to understand their roots and mm -hmm. who Judaism and Israel is. And for Israel to fully understand who it is, it also has to realize and has to understand and have a conversation with this other uh, uh, this other uh, uh, religion that developed. And I saw Nate asked about like you know. Like this question of like why did God make all these different religions? There's a rabbis that you know answer this about like God speaks to uh, to the world through you know different voices, right? Through Christianity, through to, to, through to Christians, through Christianity, through, to, to Jews, through Judaism. But there's also a sense which is there once was a unified humanity or, or unit or unification that that has been dispersed. And since then, we're all scrambling to bring back that music and bring back these sheets and these notes together to create to create a a divine sound, an eighth note, so to speak, which is divine. And uh, we're still waiting to do that. And I'll just end this ramble on when we when God creates the world during the six days, it always ends with and it was good, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that it was complete. However, the only thing He says and it wasn't good. Is when the man is alone, right? Right. It's incomplete. Right. Yeah, and, and that and that is it's true that that's happening in the context of his wife, but as as humans so, our, ourselves, we need to be together. Yeah, and I think I I said this recently. I can't remember if I said it on a live stream or if I said it in the one in the class that I'm taking with Jordan Daniel Wood right now on Maximus, but oh. I'll, it bears repeating. So if 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 it, if it's uh, if it's true that it's not good for man to be alone, and we are created in the image of God, it also strongly suggests that the purpose for creation in the first place is it is also not good for God to be alone, which points back to the entire multi unity <laughs> we, I think we have to, concept. We have to the first that it's not good for God to be alone. God chooses. To have a relationship with us, and because of that choice to have a relationship with us, he then does not desire to be alone. I, I would just say, like that, you know, we, it, that is all happening in a conversation where, like, where there's limits. All, but God needs needs nothing. But having, but with his his benevolence, has allowed himself to be in a relationship with us, where he is indeed. Uh, 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 
uh, he is indeed wanting to dance and participate with. So I have a couple of things I just want to say really quickly. Um, one of them is I think that a lot of a lot of the um, a lot of the problems that that we experience in because we focus in on the differences, for example, or even in in the construction of our own faith, like like that interaction I had with that Jewish man who said, you know, Isaiah wasn't written written to you, <laughs> wasn't written to Christians. Um, there there are centuries of action and reaction, and and because of that, people have constructed their 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 faiths around around and i want to say this carefully because it's not only that but there are elements of reaction to one another in within our own faith and um and i know that i've had to find those things and just like just very gently try to extract them away from whatever it is that i'm you know actually what i actually believe right um and and then I recently read a um, a friend Substack, and um, he's 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 being quite critical about about um, some of some of the dogma um, in the Orthodox Church, to be specific. And um, he, his latest one was about circles, and and it was this, this whole idea of face to face. Mm. And I've been, so I've been thinking about circles, right? Like he he has a. A photograph in the substack of a, a circle where the Israelites camped and I can't remember they had a name for it and then he gave he gave the Hebrew word but and then he gave all the different meanings for that um, and some of the meanings were not what you would have thought like was it it, it meant it it meant many things and I can't look it up at the moment but and and then he showed photos of Ethiopian forest churches that grow you know that are in that are circles in circles, right? And then he had a, a photo of a, you know, a bunch of people sitting around a fire, you know, and singing songs. And um and I was thinking I was thinking Atlantis. about the circle. Huh? I was gonna say Atlantis also. Yeah. Circles, circles well I was I was thinking about the circle, you know, and I thought, well that's that's nice, you know, that's nice. But what's not good about a circle? And um, the first thing that came to my mind was I, when I had goats, whenever they felt threatened, they would all stand in a circle, but they stood with their heads facing out. So their bums were all touching mm. and they, and they stood their heads out because if something was approaching, if a predator was coming, they could put their horns down and they were like, like an impenetrable wall. Mm. But all the circles that he described were circles that faced in and 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 um and i see his point because he's talking about face to face but there's another element to that circle and that circle is that everyone there are there everyone has their backs to the rest of the world right and 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 i don't I, you know i don't i don't have any like i don't i don't have any deeper thoughts on it than that <laughs> but but this is the thing that i'm that I'm that I noticed about the circle because I'm I, I'm always look I'm always going okay so that's nice that's I get that you know I see the I see all the you know the you know the the deeper meaning in that but what's what else is happening here well the, and the, and the else thing is that the, the else thing is that everybody's in you know backs are to the rest of the world right so, yeah, well, there's a way in which the circle is the symbol of the of the kind of world that Job, the Book of Job, is composed to protest against. It's 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 the world of the eternal cycle. Oh, the closed world. Yeah, it's the closed world. Yeah, and same thing with and and, and, and yeah, and and same thing with with uh, Ecclesiastes is the same thing. Like that's like. That's the, that's the world that's being talked about. Is the it's the closed world. It is in the, in the closed world. There is nothing new under the sun. So, so the true image would be would actually be would actually be a circle, but a spiral. The right? open circle, yeah, the spiral. Yeah. Right, but the, the the spiral, right, moving. I would say moving upwards in this point. So, so this in in uh, in the Bible in the Old Testament, in the Testament. We have uh, 
we have <laughs> um, the story of Balaam and uh, with his yeah, donkey. But he favorite. goes and curses Israelite. However, once he stands upon the mountain and looks down, he sees the encampment. It's the circles of the priestly class, the Levite class, and the rest of Israelites. Then there's broken down by different tribes. But for now, we have these circles. There's also different versions that where it's around the tabernacle as well. Uh, the point being, Bilaam says, um, how great our, uh, our your tent, your encampment, Israel. Right, and we are we are basically being told because this whole story is being told from the outside view. You're talking about how your backs are yeah. to the world. This whole story is being told. We don't hear the Israelites or Moses speak once. It's all being told between Balak and Balaam and Balaam's conversation with God. And in a sense, it's once they're all in theory, they're exposed to us. They're exposed to us right now, right? And they're in danger. However, their encampments are properly oriented, which is they're looking inwards at each other. However they knew how to face the entrances of their camp away from the other person's tent so they don't have to see their private, like, they don't have to see exactly what's going on in their life with them giving them privacy, right? Maintaining those boundaries, but ultimately all focused towards the tabernacle, towards uh, um, towards the ark, towards Gar, right? So you have yeah. that spiral circle and so you have all those fire. tents oriented. Mm -hmm. And it's a message to the Israelites, as long as your tents are oriented, is your civilization is oriented, starting from the family, the individual, all the way towards the whole body, you'll be protected. Even the greatest prophet of the nation won't be able to harm you or his word. He'll have to reckon and understand that ultimately he'll have to bless you. Because you'll realize that this is proper orientation at the end of the day. So I, I very much hear that, what you were saying. I, I receive it in that sense where I see that. Yeah, that, okay. Uh, well, that, that well, has let me share this with you. I, I don't know if you've ever heard it before. I've, I've referenced it, but let me just, this is, this is one of my favorite passages from meditations on Matero. This is from letter 10 on the wheel of fortune. This and Tom Burke kind of like tells this little myth, but he's trying to make a point about the, about the relationship between the spiral and, and, and openness of the world to God or Sabbath. When the father had accomplished his work on the seventh day of creation, that he had made through his word he rested on the seventh day from all his work he had made and the father blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it because on this day he rested from all his work that he had created thus the seventh day is blessed and sanctified because it is not the day of the world and the movements of the world but rather of the father himself alone it is the seventh part of the circle of the movement of the world when he withdraws and becomes immobile and silent Thus it is that the circle of movement of the world was not closed but remained open, and the seventh day was sanctified and blessed as the open part of the circle of movement of the world, in such a way that the beings of the world had access to the Father and the Father had access to them. But the serpent said, There is no freedom for the world, insofar as the circle of the world is not closed. Because freedom is to be in oneself without interference from outside, especially from above on the part of the Father. The world will always be will always follow the will of the Father and not its own, insofar as there is an opening in the circle of the world, insofar as the Sabbath exists. And the serpent took his tail in his mouth and thus formed a closed circle. He turned himself with great force and thus created in the world the great swirl which caught hold of Adam and Eve and all the other beings upon whom Adam had impressed the names that he gave them and followed them. And the serpent said to the beings of the world, moving on, the, moving on this side of the closed circle, that he formed by taking his tail into his mouth and setting himself in rotation, here is your way. You will commence by my tail and you will arrive at my head. Then you will have traversed the length of the circle of my, of my being. And you will have within you the entire closed circle, and thus you will be as free as I am. Mm -hmm. But the woman guarded the memory of the, op of the world open toward the Father and the Holy Sabbath, and she offered herself for the rending of the closed circle in herself in order to give birth to children issuing forth from the world beyond it, from the world where there is the Sabbath. Thus originated the sufferings of her pregnancy, and thus originated sorrow, on this side of the world of the serpent. And hostility came between woman and the serpent, between the generations of woman giving birth with pain and the generations of the serpent giving birth with pleasure. 
The formal will crush the head of the serpent, and the serpent will wound the heel of the woman. For the woman moves in a contrary sense to the movement of the serpent, and her head reaches to the tail of the serpent, and her heels touch the head of the serpent. This is because in the world, which is the current of the serpent, suffering is its counter movement. It was through this the counter movement of suffering that the, that there originated the counter current of the sons of woman, which is the thought born from suffering and the memory of the world of the Sabbath. Thus the sons of the woman set up altars to the father, this side of the world of the serpent. And Enosh, son of Seth, not only worshipped the father, but even came to know his name. He began to invoke the name of the father. But Enoch, a descendant of Seth, went still further. He walked with God. He did not pass through the bitterness of death, which for living beings on this side of the circle of the serpent is the way of the closed circle of the serpent, for he was taken up by the Father. For about that time, thought for, for, at, for about that time, thought aspiring to the Father succeeded in piercing the circle of the serpent and in accomplishing an opening in the closed circle. Thus initiation and prophecy could be established on this on this side of the world of the serpent. Initiation kept living the memory of the world of Sabbath, and prophecy nourished the hope of deliverance from the circle of the serpent and the future reestablishment of the world of the Sabbath. Buddhas taught the way of going out from the world of the serpent and arriving at the repose of the Sabbath. But the prophets proclaimed the transformation of the world of the serpent from within it, by, coming, by the coming of the word which will live in the world of the serpent and will reestablish within the world of the serpent not only the Sabbath, but the other six days of creation such as they were before a third of the beings from each of them were uprooted and swept down by the closed whirlwind of the serpent. Mm -hmm. This came to be the woman virgin who is the soul of the counter movement to the serpent and the suffering since the beginning of the world of the serpent received, conceived, and gave birth to the word of the Father, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst men in the world of the serpent, full of grace and truth. Man, there's so much there. Uh, <laughs> no, no joke. There's like, there's like uh, um, one second, I feel bad. Sandy, I'm sorry if uh, you're still welcome to come back, of course, at any moment if you want to. She said she, she said she's falling asleep. She said. Ah, okay. <laughs> I bored her. Uh, okay, so. so it does not bore me. Tom, that passes from Tom. There, he, there are actually two versions of it. There's one in letter 10 and one in letter 6. And it's just like, it, it, it is one of the most exciting bits in all of meditations for me. I want to comment on that. A few things. One, where should we start? Um, okay. That, that you could see that in the six days of creation, right? Uh, uh, and all the way through the seventh day, sorry, we're still in the seventh day, right? And like, it's in, in a sense that, 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 that space that was left open, or left what we call the Sabbath, or in, in Hebrew we call it Me'en Olam Abba. It's uh, it's uh, it's uh, a a, gl a glimpse of the world to come. So, yeah. And it's also a balance, like you spoke about the Buddha. I think that's very interesting because in the West, through the logo, so through the word of moving forward, right? We have this constant motion of of of, of you know, getting to a specific point. And in in the East, we really have this this, you know, uh, this the static sort of motion. You have this also this pattern repeats itself in the creation itself, where you have days which are static days. You have days where you have uh, the the waters are made, and then you have days which are in motion. Like you have the fish in the water, life in the water. You have the land, and then you have the animals on the land. And in a sense. Those both those elements of being static and of being in motion ultimately coalesce in the in the Sabbath. That you have six days worth of actual work of moving forward, and you have that one day where you actually manage to find that balance and have that rest. And unfortunately, we're still within that seventh day. The right. temple is an eighth day element, which every time it's here, it, it keeps on getting destroyed because it's not a good match with this world. We're still in that eighth, seventh day mode, 
and we're all ultimately hoping together to move forward toward, towards that eighth day. I'd also mention that 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 is very much, as you said, that snake, and obviously this is why you're mentioning it, is is the cycle that we see with with uh, Job's children. Right? That's, that's where we're in. That yeah, day. exactly. Yeah, right, right. 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 That's, yep. that's the world it's in. I would mention that's actually what pla- that's what for, when you were talking about that that's what first planted the seed of like oh I need to talk about the close uh, about the closed circle and the spiral in in a response to that in a response to that or or in parallel to that there's a conversation that the Talmud starts with a conversation at when do you when do you recite the Shema that is the conversation and in a certain way, that is a response to when, when in doubt, there's a sense where, like you know, we're 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 we're, at, we're in the sterile cycle. However, when you're in a place of doubt, you allow room for to be for, for new things to emerge, for you mm-hmm. to face, for you to move forward, because you're not in that closed circle. However, at moments of darkness or at twilight, it's scared. That's when you proclaim the Shema. Now that that conversation, our sages tell us, are happening happening in a wedding celebration and that is in a certain way a response a hint a wink back to the story of job which is our story is happening in in a in a in a cycle which is 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 like you said a spiral cycle where there's where there's birth where there's going mm-hmm. to be a marriage there's going to be a child there's a continuation and where job is stuck in that whole time that and that's why it's so relevant to our meaning crisis when you see the yeah. leadership around us and the world around us is stuck in that loop, whether it's the yeah. religious leaders or yeah. political leaders, where they do not know how to move out. They don't know how to move forward. And we have to go back to religion. But not we. I mean, how just this conversation, how fortunate we are that we get to 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 uh, to spend our time in, in, in you know, in God's word that is God's text, which is like, you know, yeah. what we do for our pastime right now, which is how blessed we are. But this is ultimately where we will find our North Star. Well, you know, the other thing about this, the, the other difference between the spur, the circle and the spiral is that the the, spi- the, the circle can, is kind of just a two-dimensional figure. Obviously, we have a globe, which is a three-dimensional but the circle itself is two dimensional, whereas the spiral, the spiral, like even if it's a even a two dimensional figure of a spiral, still hints at a third dimension by the nature of it of its appearance. Like it's pointing toward that that spiral staircase upward. Um, Are you thinking here's... of Blake's Blake's image of Jacob's ladder? J- Blake's image of Jacob's right. ladder is actually a spiral. A spiral, yeah. And uh, so this this rem- you were talking about Job as a mediator earlier, and of course, like Tomberg, in like in letter twelve of Meditations on the Tarot, which is the the letter on the image of the hangman, he like he says that like ultimately, like Job is the ultimate image of the hangman, and he specifically points at at Job's functioning as a mediator because the hangman is sus- because the hanged man is suspended between heaven and earth, and serving as a mediator between heaven and earth. Yeah, is it, but isn't he upside down? Which also points right, precisely. Which points yeah, again so toward the vertical dimension. He, his feet, his feet are up, like in the heavens. His head is on the earth. Yeah, which I, which I find really challenging, <laughs> because <laughs> it, it has to do with he's upside down. Folded in? Huh? Say it again. Isn't one leg folded in? Yeah. Yep. That's yeah. exactly right. With one leg folded in. Yeah. 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 Um, my esteemed colleagues and friends, yeah. uh, I'm going to have to bust a move. Yeah, it's really late where you are, so. I mean, yeah, it's 12, uh, 11 o'clock, not so bad. Well, that's, that'd be super late for me. <laughs> but I get yeah, up really I, early. But I just want to point out that we're, we're, we're coalescing in the center here, if you notice. Like, this is, <laughs> this is where... Where we, um, I don't know. I just think God is, you know, more manifest. But yeah, great. I love it. Love these. I I, I I love it too. We are we are fortunate that uh, you know the God who created the universe. He knows us by our name. He's interested in us. We are interested in Him. We have opportunity to dance with Him and create with Him. 
and, and it's not only opportunity, it's a responsibility. And to those who, who hear the call, who are interested in hearing the call, um, the world that presents itself to us, whether it be meaning crisis or technological crisis or whatever, whatever it be, uh, we have to take it seriously. I mean, the Collins seemingly are taking that very seriously, right? They're building their whole their whole map, but but there's something beautiful in that, which is like you could see how seriously they're taking it. I think we 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 need to as well. Can I ask one last question? And and this, Lord, it's put me in, like Sherry brought up Jacob earlier, and we've been talking about we've been talking about mediation. Like what? What do you think? What is it? What is it that I do that drives Jacob so crazy? And what could I do differently in order to improve that situation? I mean, he. He wants to be very clear, like. He might watch this. He might think this is like way too much kumbaya. He might think I sounded like a complete heretic. He might think like, I mean, there can be many things he's going to say. Uh, mm-hmm. He might say like, I can't even watch it. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, I think, I think that he, it's very important for him to, to define certain elements to have it be defined that way. That doesn't mean that he doesn't have the flexibility uh, to also have a much more nuanced conversation, but it sort of has, he needs to have his terms met, so to speak, for him to be able to engage in a conversation. Mm-hmm. And if, if, I know this sounds silly, but like if one wants to engage with Jacob, one has to uh, sort of admit or, or participate with a certain jargon and then allow Jacob to uh, articulate what you would say as X but he says as Y and now use his terminology to continue that conversation because mm-hmm. otherwise he has this automatic reaction to be like ah that's idol worship and you're like right but I didn't mean it that way he's like right but that's that's all I hear when you say that sir. and it's important for him that if you in brave space want to have a conversation with a Jacob he'll say don't use that terminology Mm-hmm. it's wrong or it's incorrect and while maybe I'm wrong I might say like that term bothers like for example when you said God needs a relationship to us I felt the need to say well God doesn't need to now you'd be like why do you have to do that you understand that Nate also understands but to me that was it's too much for me to create, allow a space where I feel like that is being said with the relationship of God I have I think Jacob is very sensitive specifically in Christian spaces where yeah. The terminology is used in a very specific way. I believe that's why one has to be sensitive with him. I think it's worth the engagement and worth, worth. let's say, I'm not telling you to do anything. You're telling me not to give up. Are you telling me not to give up? Ultimately, I think the fruitful conversation is there. I think you have, now, to, you have to woo Jacob. <laughs> Get to woo like for, 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 for example, Nate, for example, let's say there's a conversation and Jacob got on right now and he would be like shaking his head with his face. <laughs> like, 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 you're killing me. I hate doing this, right? Like, first of all, you have to just be, you have to play with that. That's the personality. Then you also have to realize that like he's going to come in at some point where he gets like emotional and he's like, no, well, you're killing Jews by doing that. And you have to take a deep breath and be like, okay. I know, I know he doesn't mean that, like, and I, even when he says I'm Malay, <laughs> you have to be able to hold that in a space where, like, it's, it's, it's a nation speaking, it's a person speaking, it's a religion speaking, it's history speaking. Well, you know what, it's also an art. It's like, I'm telling you, I've learned so much just watching you and Jacob talk, Kezi, because he's not a Zionist and you are, and I'm like, Okay, this is I'm this is interesting. Like this is like watching a wrestling match and learning technique, you know? Like these are two Jewish brothers who like know See, how to have an uh, an So is, as a Christian anarchist, Zion is the only nation I approve of. <laughs> <laughs> but no, really, I've learned a lot about about that this arguing for the sake of heaven thing, you know? Like I think 
and um, and then just hearing stories from from uh, the Zohar because um, I I went through that that series there that. Uh, you know the rabbinic stories and all all of the you know the little headbutting and bashing and you know I I I can relate to that because I can have those kinds of conversations without feeling personally affronted by them, and um and I think that's something that we have to shed and I think that's also why I referred back to the reactive element to like the centuries of action and reaction right where not only human beings but whole religions have put in artifice in order to keep out things that they perceive as dangerous to them that make them too vulnerable and um and i'm just really grateful that you you know that you're giving us just a little you know like i said to yosef once thank you for cracking the door open for me so i can look in because i really need to mm -hmm. i really do I would say thank you for uh, uh, thank you for uh, um, thank you for you know having the the interest and the intrigue and thanking for you know for also again, uh, creating the space and obviously you know a large thanks to BBK. But I want to touch about that for a second, even though I was going to say this is the last thing I'm going to say. That's going to be the last thing I was going to say. <laughs> but but um, Nate, you're coming and saying. Right, like, listen, Chazi, you don't need a chain. Right, again, huge statement. Like, I, I, I know, like, I, we just said, like, the past yeah. thing. Huge, huge statements. Mm -hmm. There was this guy named Brian from, uh, uh, I forget, some like, uh, you know, it's like a messianic Judaism, right? And like, they're down to like, I, I believe, fossil guys as well. And I met this guy in Israel. I bought him on Jacob's Discord. Jacob like lost, like lost his mind. He's like, oh my god, this guy's like, just saying this is happening. I can't believe this. I remember. He, like, went he went nuts on this guy and he gave him like the, you know, and that now there was like another video he showed and Jacob wrote, he's like, honestly, he wrote back, back to this guy, Ryan, in a much softer manner. And so like, you know, I actually, I really just feel bad for you. Like, I, I feel bad for you. Like I, I have now you could look at that as being like, Oh, like, who are you to talk down to you? I see that is just Jacob now realizing if there was his hate, which I understand why he's like, don't stop, stop trying to convert me or try to convert my people or my, or my communities. Now Jacob is looking at someone like, you know, you're still a, a lost soul, so to speak, again, in Jacob's face, but there's a love there. Yes, yeah, sir. that could then develop into a more fruitful conversation like they started happening, which there could even be an understanding. So like, these things take time, but like, they can only happen in a space, like you're saying, Sherry, where that Talmud space happens, where there's little jabs happen. Mm -hmm. I believe that happens over here with the trolling, with the pushing, with that language. That's why people need to allow for that to happen. Right. You and you and Luke have, ha have had your attention, but you both have not given up on yourselves and on the relationship. Yeah. And that's really what matters, which is like, and that's why when that fight will happen again, and it will happen again, I know that it's happening with your love. And I know yeah. that it's happening. From, so, so I think that's very important for us to build, build uh, that muscle. And lastly, I'll just say, <laughs> with regard to EVK and, and interest in your perspective, which is Nathan, honey? what is he shepherding under here? Like, I know he says like he's a Calvinist pastor, but if he's, if all of this is happening under like, quote unquote, his oversight and he's engaging with these conversations and he is like open to having these conversations and, and synthesizing these conversations, is he still a Calvinist? Is he not <laughs> just like, is he not like is he not fringe? Yeah. You know, I watched Sam and uh, Father De Young's conversation right before this, and and in, and I wrote in the comments. I said, "Excellent discussion. Thank you both." And then I said, "Can't wait to can't wait to hear the conversations about what each one of us in the TLC really believed centuries right. from now." <laughs> What did Sherry really believe? What did Kesley really believe? What did Paul Vanderclay really believe? I don't know. I think I think I mean there could be hubris to this, and I, I think we avoided like the 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 navel gazing. Even saying the term navel gazing is already navel gazing because people <laughs> often, but but uh, I think that this does have the potential of becoming something um, something larger 
something with with impact. And I say that I honestly say that because if I didn't believe that, I would not put in the amount of time I do. Like I'm saying, I'm yeah. thinking right now the conversation I'm having. It's really because I also, I really believe, and 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 Nate and I were having this conversation. That these are the front line, and I, it's not my personal crusade of like you know the, the, the no hide movement. Like I said, like I don't I don't talk about that really. That's really something that people could come to me to about. It's more about the conversation of seekers. I mean, seekers of unity, but seekers of God ultimately. And seekers, yeah. like, that's yes. what I'm into. To, mm-hmm. For those people on that side of the map who want to know more, go deeper, understand more. And and I think like, and like the fact that it's shaping up the way it is shaping up and the fact that I find myself as a Jew in this, in this position, I feel like I have the responsibility, I guess, to somewhat... You know, still be involved because, like, if this does become something large, and I would, I would hope, if 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 only I could be in any way assisting to open up a crack to much wiser and greater uh, Jews and rabbis and I to come and pave the way and have like conversations at the level that like you know I can only dream to have or at least listen to one day as a student. But uh, if I could take any part of that, uh, that would be enough. I would feel very grateful just for that. Mm-hmm. And thank you, obviously, both of you for participating in this in this crazy little corner of mm-hmm. uh, DLC. All right. Well, thank yeah. you for joining me, Huzzy. Appreciate you so it. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, everyone. We're going to wrap it Good up. Night, Good night.